Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Talking with Heroes talk show program. I am Bob Calvert, your host. Ted is behind the camera. And we're broadcasting here from Afghanistan, Bagram Airfield, on TalkingWithHeroes.com. Our online news site is ThankYouForYourService.us. And we're still with the Fort Drum's 10th Aviation Combat Brigade. And we are now with the Public Affairs Officer for the Brigade. Brigade Public Affairs Officer. So I'd like you to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, where you're from, and how long you've served. Okay, um, my name is Sergeant First Class J.R. Williams. I'm from Syracuse, New York, or at least the area. I call Pulaski home. Go Pulaski. And uh, I've been in the Army for 15 years, um, 13 and change active, and I do have some National Guard time in there. Okay, now we have a lot to talk about, but before we do, mm -hmm. you're not really bouncing right now, but kind of I'm going to bounce. Talk about why you're bouncing. Okay. The camera's seeing it, too. Um, I sit on a stability ball. I am very much into fitness. I like to work out. Um, but also, it made sense because when we first got here, we didn't have enough chairs. And we had one chair. It was pretty rigid. It was kind of like an easy chair. So uh, I gave the two rolly chairs to the other soldiers. And I was sitting in the hard chair, but it was, it was really bad for my back. And so everyone else sitting on these stability balls. And I had done it once before in my office until it got popped. Um, so I brought it back, and it's been great. And my abs are in great condition, uh, so I can go home and be proud of that, I guess. So yeah. Is this like a commercial for these balls? Because I've seen them on, on infomercials <laughs> on TV. Um, and actually, you lose weight with it? Or you... Well, I did lose a quarter of an inch from my waist just sitting on it. It's obvious. And it's, it's probably fun. better for your back, too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was a lot better than the hard, easy chair. It was just, it wasn't good. It was too low. It was too far back. So, you know, you're typing. So far. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> hey, I have great balance on it, too. I'm very coordinated. Well, you've been doing this now for almost a year, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, first, talk about your military service. Um, you've been in 15 years. Mm -hmm. Is this your first deployment? No, this is my uh, second deployment. I deployed to Iraq uh, from 2008 till 2009. And then I had a little bit of a break. And now I'm um, back over here in Afghanistan. Um, the last time I was with the 10th Mountain Division, and now this time around I'm with the Combat Aviation Brigade. Okay, now you, I was going to ask you this at the end, but you brought it up. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, you got back from Iraq a year to the date. Not, no, I actually had a little bit more time. I had 14 months at home. Okay, and then you're, and then you're back here in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Something people don't realize, the deployments in between is, can be very short. Absolutely. Yeah. And for, for most of the, the members of the 10th Combat Aviation Brigade, they were home like one year to the day before they turn around to deploy one more time, come on back. Um, and you know, in that year home, it sounds like a lot of time, a year's you know, plenty for downtime, but when you consider that when you come back, you have to kind of go through your stuff, put it away, reorder, and then, oh my gosh, look, we gotta get ready, start planning, start preparing. If you are either um, officer or enlisted, there's still professional development schools that you need uh, to become a better soldier, better leader, and those also take time. And so really, when you think of all the things, all the training events that happen, and take place. I mean, they're necessary. You need them. That's how people stay alive when they come and do these things. Um, but the family time really gets whittled away at home, and so you're really kind of forced to make the most of your small moments. And that can be a great thing too. So. You need to answer the phone if you can. We can listen on camera. Watch, <laughs> watch, watch your work. Now. Let's watch Talk your work. Welcome, PAO. Folks. This is Sergeant Williams. How can I help you? Uh, who's down there? Oh, okay. I'm not sure what to say about that. Okay, well, I think um, we were doing interviews in here, and so I think that's why he went downstairs. Okay, um, if he's there, just let, let it go ahead and let him do it. All right, thanks. Bye. Now, in six years of doing this, I don't think I've ever had a phone ring and somebody talk on the phone while the camera is still on. He's the first. <laughs> first, on the, first on a ball like this, yeah. stability ball, and now a phone call. Okay, we'll talk about what you do. Okay. 
Well, my job as the public affairs officer is to um, tell our soldiers stories and let the people back home and, uh, and people around the world know what we're doing. Um, as you can tell, especially in Afghanistan, it's, it's kind of tough to get around um, unless you can fly. And so we really uh, work really hard to let everyone back home know what we're doing so the families know that their loved ones are doing great things and that they're okay, you know. Um, it's also a morale boost for the, for the soldiers. They really enjoy it when they see a story that we've written about them show up, you know, in the paper. Or um, we sometimes will coordinate to have AFN come out and they do the, the TV, um, TV show. So they, they get excited if they see themselves on TV. And then, of course, we link all of that to Facebook or Flickr, you know, and um, it's, it's great. It's a great way to keep in touch with the families, really. Absolutely. Well, all, everything we're doing goes on Facebook, and you're welcome to take all the videos we've got here and put them right on your Facebook page. We certainly will. Yeah, we want to get the stories out, too. That's why we're here. Um, talk about, like, things that have happened here. I know, um, describe first what you do with the Aviation Brigade. We've talked to a lot of soldiers, but you kind of see it on a bigger picture. Okay, well, the... The 10th Combat Aviation Brigade provides full-spectrum aviation operations throughout RC East. So that's kind of, um, RC East is, is our chunk of Afghanistan, So and it's actually quite large. So we have, you know, um, our, our aviators are actually, you know, most units are all consolidated in one spot. Well, you know, Aviation Brigade is a little bit different in that we're, we're kind of staged in different areas. So we have... Um, soldiers at remote locations. And even, um, you know, when you consider the different jobs that go into aviation, you know, we have non-aviation soldiers. I'm non-aviation. I, I don't fly and I don't help them get up in the air. Um, but we do have a lot of support soldiers who are also out at these remote locations, these small cops and fobs making things happen. Um, but when I talk about full spectrum aviation, we move people, we move parts, we move equipment, I mean, this really is an aviation-centric war. You can't get around that well without aviation assets. And so that's what we do for, for RC East. We provide that aviation asset that's so critical um, just to get around the battle, um, the battle space. And you make sure that the aircraft itself, the equipment, is safe. We have our own maintainers, right. absolutely. Um, our own um, mechanics, um, our test pilots. I mean, there's, there's really a lot that goes into it. I'm sure you've been out and sure. talked to some of these, uh, these guys, but it's amazing. Um, it's also amazing to me because a lot of our maintainers and our, a lot of our mechanics, the people who are in charge and our, our crew chiefs, the, the soldiers who are in charge of keeping the aircraft in the air and making sure that people get around safely are really young. And I can say that because I'm not a young person anymore. Um, these, oh, yeah, sure. compared, um, to well, me, compared to me, you're young. Well, Very maybe. Young. I'll take it. Okay. Um, but these soldiers are in their 20s. You know what okay. I'm saying? They're, they're in their 20s. Um, you know, they have a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. They're handling equipment that's, you know, uh, in the millions of dollars. And they do it with pride. And, and they do it with a sense of, you know, purpose and duty. And it's just amazing when I go out and talk to them and ask what they're doing. You know, to them, they're very humble about it. They're just like, ah, oh, just my job. Um, but it's, it's actually a lot more, uh, you know, when you do something every day, you're just kind of like, oh, I don't really do anything. But to an outsider, it's like, wow, I, you know, don't program DVR if I can at all help it, get someone else to do it for me, you know. Yeah. So these guys are keeping our aircraft in the air. Yeah. And everybody that has to get around someplace, soldiers, civilians, contractors, myself, media, we all depend on you. Uh, absolutely. Everybody. So there's a lot of people that really depend on your brigade. Okay. And our, from what we've seen, the troops we've talked to, the places we've been to, everybody's doing an absolutely great job, but I see that everywhere I go. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you don't come all the way out here and do, and you, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes mm -hmm. into it. And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, there's just, there's sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So you don't make those sacrifices and then come out here and not do your and absolute not, best. Right. You know, I know for myself, I have a husband and daughter, and this is actually um, my third year away in the last five. So um, before Afghanistan, before Iraq, I was in Korea, and they've been 
waiting for me, you know, for five years. So I, I, I definitely don't take that lightly. I don't think the other soldiers with families and loved ones um, back home, I don't think they take that lightly either. They know that there's someone back home who's making sacrifices too. So you come out here and you do your best. You know, yeah. you make every moment count. I know when we first got here, um, you know, they were going around talking to the soldiers and said, hey, listen, we want you to think about something. Instead of counting the days, make the days count. Make the days count. So it's kind of interesting perspective when you think about it like that, you know. I look at every day, you know, every day that I'm gone from my from my daughter, I'm like, wow, you know, because I write her every day too. So there's some days where, oh, what am I going to tell her about this day, right? So I, I do try to, at least personally, make every every day here count uh, and make make everyone back home proud and, and make them feel like we came over here to to accomplish some things. And they can see because they sacrifice too. That's a whole other side of this. The family sacrifice. Absolutely. You know, and and they get a little picture from you what the reason, why you're doing this and so they know they're doing the right thing yeah. okay now you work a lot of hours mm -hmm. everywhere we've been Iraq and Afghanistan we hear the stories uh, maybe a day off every two weeks or so and mm -hmm. 12 14 whatever hours a day and um, but yet you have another project you got involved with that you volunteered for we heard a little bit about it earlier in the week why don't you share that with us um, well, that's, that's another thing, um, besides volunteering their time to, um, to deploy soldiers during the deployment, will also um, devote what little spare time they have to help someone out. There's um, a couple of programs here on Bagram. One is Operation Care, where they gather uh, items, usually from people's care packages if they have something left over, and then they kind of consolidate it and then they, they redistribute it so that the soldiers who are out at the cops in those remote locations that don't really get um, a lot of supplies and they don't have a, a green beans or a PX at their location, they can still get you know the good stuff. Um, but they also take some of that stuff and they bring it out with the humanitarian, uh, uh, yeah, the humanitarian teams and, and they pass them out to the, to the local Afghans. So um, everything that comes here you know, has a use and so soldiers can go down and either help, either help package things, help gather things. And then one of the things that kind of stemmed out of Operation Care is this literacy program um, at the Egyptian hospital. And that's, uh, that's where a lot of the aviation soldiers got involved. For one, as aviation, um, you don't really get to meet the Afghan people, uh, except for maybe, you know, uh, the rare time where you, you run into someone who's actually local who works on base. Um, so you know your opportunities are extremely limited compared to your peers who are going out all the time. So they had the the children coming in um, to get treatment, and then also sometimes just coming with parents. And so to keep them occupied, they started this literacy program. And so uh, I was approached and said, "Hey, we really need some female soldiers too, because we'd like to encourage more women to attend." And so, being public affairs, I cast the net and, and uh, encourage people to come. We actually had quite a few soldiers uh, come out and, and volunteer for the literacy program because this was their opportunity to meet uh, an Afghan person. And it was, uh, you know, their rare opportunity to interact and do something personally to make a difference, to help, and to also just be that example of, hey, I know you're probably hearing things or maybe you've seen things that are, you know, hurtful. But you know, here's a positive image of a U.S. soldier. I'm here to help. I'm here to show you that I'm just mm -hmm. I'm not that different.